extremely powerful. I mean, it's the limit of expansion, let's say. And in the history of uh, the relationship, the cultural and general relationship between the East and the West, as acceptation of printing would have meant the acceptation of the first important technology. So, you know, the two histories t started to differ very much, as you know. This initial rejection of printing was one of the many reasons that caused science in the Islamic world to fall behind the West. It coincided with a host of global changes, all of which affected the way science developed. The first and most obvious reason for the slowdown in Islamic science is that the Islamic empire itself falls into decline from the mid-1200s. One reason for this is that it's under attack from all sides. From the east are the Mongols. In 1258, they invaded the capital Baghdad, and it's said that the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers ran black for days with the ink of the books they'd destroyed. But trouble was also brewing in the far west of the empire. Islamic Spain, already fragmented into separate city-states, now faced a new threat, a united and determined onslaught from the Christian north. The reconquest, as it was called, raged for hundreds of years but culminated in the 15th century when Ferdinand II and Isabella led an army which forced the last of the Muslims in Granada to surrender in 1492. The Christians were intent on removing every last vestige of Islamic civilization and culture from Spain. In 1499, they ordered the burning in this square in Granada of all Arabic texts from Granada's libraries, except for a small number of medical texts. Within about a hundred years, every Muslim in Spain had either been put to the sword, burnt at the stake, or banished. And Christians from the east of Europe were intent on reclaiming the Holy Land. The Crusades. Bent on carving out a holy Christian Levant and claiming the holy city of Jerusalem, the Crusaders launched a massive attack on northern Syria. They quickly captured this castle and turned it into one of their strongholds. Then with ruthless and missionary zeal, they marched on Jerusalem. And as the empire fought with its neighbors, it collapsed into warring fiefdoms. The Mamluks, slaves who originally belonged to the state of Egypt, became its leaders. The Bourbon Almohads ruled Morocco and Spain in the 13th century, and the north of Syria and Iraq splintered into a series of city-states. But for many historians of science, the biggest single reason for the decline in Islamic science was a rather famous event that took place in 1492. That year, the entire political geography of the world changed dramatically when a certain Christopher Columbus arrived in the Americas. I explain it with the phenomena of the discovery of the new world in 1492. The immediate result is that you got immense amount of gold and silver coming to the royal houses of Europe at the time and all the adventurous um, uh, empires and royal houses of the time who were setting colonies all over the world. And science always follows the money. As the 16th and 17th centuries came and went, that money, power, and hence scientific will moved through Spain and Italy and on to Britain. By the 17th century, England, sitting at the center of the lucrative Atlantic trade route, could afford big science. And that ultimately explains why the greatest book in world science, Sir Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, the book that ultimately explains the motion of the sun, the moon, and the planets, was not published in Baghdad, but in London. It was necessary for him to have data of astonishing accuracy gathered from 
across the world. Global inventories of numbers, observations, positions. The heights of tides, the positions of comets and planets, uh, the rate at which pendulums beat. It's a global project. It's big science. And many of those observations, many of those mathematical models were, of course, models initially developed by Islamic astronomers in Egypt and the Near East and Central Asia. But there's a final twist in the tale. As the wealth of the Islamic nations subsided through war, political and religious entrenchment, and the loss of its lucrative trade, so its science declined. But what this doesn't explain is why their scientific achievements have been so forgotten. And that's partly because as Europeans colonized great swathes of the Middle East and Asia, they actively encouraged the idea that the civilizations they encountered were moribund and in decline. It seems the English and the French were uncomfortable with subjugating people whose knowledge and science may have been as sophisticated as their own. So it became important to portray the Islamic world in a very specific way. Namely that yes, they once were very sophisticated and they had great scientists and philosophers, but of course now they've fallen into decay. Somehow this point of view made the whole colonial enterprise seem much more palatable. One of the most fascinating developments, I think, in the history of the encounter between Western Europeans and other cultures is a kind of shift which has got fundamental and terrible consequences amongst Western Europeans when they start to reflect on why they are superior. It doesn't often cross Western Europeans' minds that they might not be superior to everybody else. For a very long time, after all, Western Europeans in general, the British for example, suppose that their superiority lay in their religion. But then I think around the 1700s, we begin to see a shift. And the shift is from claiming that the reason for European superiority is its religion, to the reason for European su superiority is its science and technology. It, eventually it ends up with the famous phrase, we have the Gatling gun, and they do not. Europeans in that period were quite prepared to acknowledge that in ancient times,